morning again, church. I'm going to invite everyone to stand with me this morning as we get ready. And uh, today through technology, we have the great privilege and honor to welcome our West Seattle family that's joining us today via broadcast. Can we welcome our West Seattle family this morning? Let's give them a big shout out. For those of you who may be our guests with us today, we are one church in multiple locations in West Seattle. We just want to welcome you today. We're excited for what God's doing in West Seattle. And big shout out to Pastor Craig. Uh, we stole Pastor Keldon today. He's actually here with us in the front row this morning. So I promise we'll give him back to West Seattle, but we borrowed him for today. So, uh, man, I'm so excited for us to continue our series today entitled Bold. And uh, we're going to be in a couple different places in Scripture. But I just wanted to open up today with a word of prayer. And then we're going to dive into it. Is anybody excited for church this morning? Come on. Well, let me open us up with a word of prayer and then we're going to read some scripture together. And, and really my hope and prayer today is this. We're going to take a look at what does it mean to share a bold faith, not just to live a bold faith, but to share a bold faith with others. And my hope for us today is this, whether you're in Issaquah or in West Seattle, that as we open up God's word, it's going to encourage us. It's going to challenge us and it's going to empower us to be able to be the church, to be able to be the followers of Jesus that he has created for us to be. And that literally we would make a difference, not just when we gather together, but we would make a difference when when we go. And uh, so I pray that your heart will be open. And listen, uh, you're going to hear me mention this a few different times in this. You're not exempt, West Seattle, but today is participation. Come on, somebody. I really do believe that church is something that is meant to be enjoyed, not just endured. Hello. So today, let's enjoy being together. Let's enjoy being in the house of the Lord. David even said, man, my heart leaps when they say, let's go to the house of the Lord. So today, man, feel free to laugh. Feel free to enjoy what we're doing. If something is good, don't be afraid to shout down, amen. Come on. Doesn't mean the sermon's gonna get any longer. Just means it's gonna get better. Okay. So let's pray. Let's get into it. Jesus, we love you. God, we just pray today that you would open every heart. Lord, that you would just open every ear to hear what you're wanting to say. God, prepare us even right now. Lord, I pray for those who are here today who are skeptical who have questions. God, I pray for prodigals today who are far from you, Lord. I pray for those of us who've been walking near to you for years, Lord. I pray today you would speak to each and every one of us. God, that you draw us closer to you, open up our eyes to see you more clearly today, Father. And Lord, we pray that you would just have your way in this place. You would do what only you could do. And God, that we would leave here different, changed, transformed because of a moment in your presence that marks our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Go ahead, turn to your neighbor, give him a fist bump, say, get ready, get ready, get ready. Let's go. <clears throat> hey, we're going to start in Romans today. We're going to go to Romans chapter 10, and then we are going to jump over to John chapter 17. So hopefully you brought your Bible. If not, it is okay. We're going to throw it up on the screen for you. Uh, but we're going to be in Romans chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 13. And Romans is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. And this is a famous piece of text, but my hope is, is today, even though this may be a familiar piece of text to you, uh, that your heart will be open to hear some new things that God is wanting to say to us. Here we go. Romans 10, starting in verse 13, I'm, I'm reading today out of the New Living Translation. It says this, for everyone, someone say everyone. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anybody grateful this morning that God's grace through the gospel of Jesus is not just for a few, but it's for everybody? Come on. I, I, I've been touched by this gospel and I'm so grateful that my name is included in the everyone, right? That when I had a moment in my life when I needed God to meet me and rescue me, I was included in the opportunity to receive God's grace. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring the good news. There's a progression here that the Apostle Paul is, is walking through. We're going to dive a little bit deeper in, in a moment. But there's a progression of salvation, of hearing, of believing, of calling on Jesus to the goal, the point of being saved. Now jump with me over to John 
chapter 17, and we're gonna take a look at some of the words of Jesus on the same subject. So the Apostle Paul writing, writes in Romans 10, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but how can they hear unless someone tells them? John 17, uh, and we're gonna be starting in verse, make sure I get it right for you, verse 18 says this, this is Jesus speaking. And what Jesus is doing right now is Jesus is praying to the Father. So we get a little insight into Jesus having a conversation with God the Father. He says this, just as you sent me into the world. So he's talking to the Father, just as Father as you sent me into the world. Now I am sending them into the world. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor. Look at, in, look at them in the eye right now. Go ahead, participate, look at them and say, hey. Oh, come on, West Seattle was louder than that. Yeah. Come on, go ahead and look at your neighbor and say, hey, you've been sent. Now turn to the other neighbor you just completely ignored and look at them and say, you've been sent too. Jesus says, Father, just as you sent me, now I am sending them into the world and I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they could be made holy by your truth. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. This is why this is so important for us today, church. Jesus is praying and he's not just praying for the 12 that are with him. He's praying for you and he's praying for me. He says, Father, I'm praying and interceding for everyone who will ever believe in this message. Literally, he's talking about 2019, the people that are sitting in church at Eastridge on a Sunday morning in March. I'm praying for them that they would not only hear the message, but they would be sent so the world might know who I am. He says this, I pray for everyone who would believe in me through their message. I pray that they would be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so the world will believe that you sent me. There's something important for us this morning to understand that we have been made by God for the purpose of being sent. If you're taking notes this morning, the title of our message, and I hope you are, uh, but if you're taking notes, the title for today's message is simply this, Made to Share. Made to Share. Have you ever noticed that there are some things in life that, man, they're just meant to be shared? right? Like a good movie. Man, I'm super excited about Avengers Endgame coming up. Come on, it's going to be awesome. But how many of you know when you see a good movie, what do you do? You tell your friends. Oh my gosh, have you seen such and such? It was incredible. Maybe you're not a movie person. That's fine. Maybe you're a book person. You just have way more time on your hands than everybody else, right? But when you read a good book, what do you do? You share it with somebody. Or how many of you know when you've got a good joke, any dads in the house? Come on, dad joke people. You're always looking for the right moment to share a good joke. Why? Because something that is great really finds its fulfillment when it's shared, right? You know, our younger generation, we love sharing a good meme. When you got a good meme, man, you just want to send that out to everybody. Or some of you in, in the room right now, you're really way too good at sharing things on Facebook that you shouldn't be sharing, you know, like... I really don't want to see any more cat pictures. Like it just, you know, I'm just not interested in cat pictures, you know. You know, I really don't really care what you ate last night, you know. Like you just want to share. We share a lot of things, right? Have you noticed that men and women like to share different things? Women love to share things that are beautiful, right? Like they love to share things that are enjoyable. If a woman ever says to you, smell this, it's gonna be awesome. Like it's gonna be some incredible fragrance. It's gonna be something that you're gonna love and you're gonna enjoy. If a woman ever comes to you and says, here, eat this, it's gonna be delicious. It's gonna be great. But if a man ever comes to you and says, smell this, <laughs> run, right? Like, it's just not gonna be a good experience. Why? Because men and women, we, we share things for different reasons, you know? But even though, even though in life we share different things, there are some things that are just made by design. They are created for the purpose of sharing. And while I was thinking about this idea and concept, one thing that came to my mind are these icebreakers mints. You guys ever seen these icebreakers mints before? You see them everywhere. They're, they're in the aisle at every grocery store as you're trying to check out, you know? And one of the things that's so interesting to me about these icebreakers mints is there's one side of the container that says one. 
And if you open up that side of the container, it's a really small little hole, right? It's really just designed for personal consumption. If I need a breath mint, which is often, and it's just for me, and the only person I'm really looking out at it for is myself, I go to the one side of the container because it's just for me. But then there's this other side of the container that has been intentionally designed and it says many. So there's the one side and the many side. On the many side, if you open it up, it's ginormous. It's huge. Why? Because by design, they wanted these icebreaker mints to not just be something you experience for yourself, but they wanted it to be something that you would be forced or encouraged to share, right? Now, here's the problem. If you're anything like me, I don't like sharing. I'm, I'm not really great at sharing. If I'm completely honest with you, if you ever ask for a piece of gum or you ask for a mint, I will always with a smile on my face, absolutely, I would love to share with you, of course. And on the inside, I'm like, Rrr. you ever had that moment where it's like your last piece of gum? Why is it that they only ask for a piece of gum when it's your last piece of gum? You ever had that happen before? It happens to me with my kids all the time. I'll pull up my last piece of gum and Trenton will look at me with those eyes. Dad, can I have a piece of gum? I'm like, sure, buddy, here you go. And I'm like, go, oh, mm, that was the last one. Because inherently, each and every one of us, our natural design, our default mode is we look out for ourselves. We tend to look out for the one. In fact, psychologists teach us that sharing is not a uh, intrinsic behavior. Sharing is a learned behavior, meaning when you come out of the womb, you are not hardwired to think about the needs of others and to look at the things that you have in your possession and go, man, I just really hope I can give this away to somebody else today. That's why any of you that have children have heard this demonic four letter word come out of their mouth over and over and over, mine. Because from the moment we start sucking air on this earth, we have a natural tendency to look out for the one. But what happens when something that was designed for the purpose of sharing is put into the hands of someone who doesn't want to share it? The entire purpose, the entire mission, the entire reason why it was made the way it is is missed. And I wonder for many of us today if the reality is that when we receive the gospel of grace into our life, but are reluctant to share that same gospel with others, with the many, if the gospel misses its purpose and design in our life. And I wonder if for many of us, we actually miss out on our own God-given design and purpose for our life. Because you see, the gospel was never meant to be something that we just personally consume. There is a moment where we receive the gospel of grace. It changes us. It transforms us. There's a moment in your life where maybe you just need to focus on the one. You need your Jesus time. You need to get into the word. You need to have that moment of personal consumption with the gospel. But there's also an entire other side of your life that God designed for the many. There's an entire other side of the gospel that he intentionally created, not just so that we can become Christian consumers, but so that we can become gospel dispensers, that literally the gospel fulfills its purpose in our life, not when it's kept to ourselves, but when it's expressed, when it's shared, when it's given away, not just to the one, but to the many. Why? Because the gospel was made to share. You were made to share it. God designed you the way you are, put you where you are, gifted you the way he gifted you, not so that we could just sit in a service on a Sunday morning, fill a seat, sing some songs, feel good about ourselves and walk out of here after a Sunday morning, but God has created you the way you are so that you could walk out of this building and be sent to the highways and the byways to be dispensers of the gospel of grace, sharing it with the many so that the gospel would fulfill its purpose in your life. But the problem is sharing our faith, man, it's, it's intimidating. If we're being honest, it's scary. It's not always something that just naturally flows off the tongue in the ease of conversation with your friends. You're not sitting around going, hey, did you see that movie the other day? Man, Captain Marvel, that was amazing. By the way, how do you feel about your eternal security? 
just not always that easy, right? For some of us, you know, we have reluctance when it comes to sharing our faith because we're worried that we're not gonna be able to answer questions that people might have. Or, or maybe we're gonna come across looking like a hypocrite or, or maybe we're, we're intimidated about sharing our faith because it's gonna cost us something. Maybe being labeled a Christian could actually become a lid to our career. Maybe it's gonna limit the relationships we're able to have with people. Maybe it's gonna cost us our comfort in a way that we're not really ready to give up yet. Maybe we're too intimidated, shy, or afraid. But also I think for many of us in the room, part of the reason why we don't regularly share our faith with others because it's just really not on our mind a whole lot. It's not something that we daily think about. It's not something that we have, have daily made a, a focus and a point of attention because the things that I've learned in my life are the things that I focus on and the things that I give intention and attention to are typically the things that I act upon. They're the things that become a priority to me. Just let me ask you a question. When was the last time you woke up in the morning, spent time in the word of God before you went off to work and prayed a bold prayer before you walked out the door that says, God, open my eyes to see the opportunities you're gonna bring me today. God, make me more aware of the moments that I'm going to have to share the gospel with somebody today. God, make my spirit come alive. Give me wisdom, discernment. Give me the word. Why? Because the things that I give attention to, hello, the things that I focus on, the things I make a priority in my life, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to become more aware of the opportunities and I will become more prone to act on the moments that God gives me. Here's part of the problem. I honestly believe that for many of us, we don't actively share our faith because it's just not something that we think about often. Don't take my opinion for it. Barna Research uh, just came out with an entirely new set of data around the subject of evangelism in 2019. Just did a bunch of research. If you're not familiar with Barna, they're the leading faith-based research organization. And uh, something that just came out is they polled churchgoers, as they polled Christians, <clears throat> excuse me, they asked the question, are you familiar with the Great Commission? Now, the Great Commission is found in Matthew chapter 28. It's one of the last times Jesus would speak with his disciples before he would ascend to heaven. And he says this, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's called the Great Commission because it's not just a good idea, it's a God commandment. He says, sharing the gospel with people is not just something I'm encouraging you to do. It's something I have created you to do. It's something I've designed you to do. And it's something I'm commanding you to do. As a follower of Jesus, this is something that we are been told by God is not optional, it's required. Here's the research that came out. I'm gonna throw it up. There's a little pie chart for us here. Have you heard of the Great Commission? 51% over half of people that attend church don't know what the Great Commission is. Don't even know what it is. Couldn't quote it, couldn't tell it to you, couldn't even articulate what it is. An additional 25% says, yes, I've heard of it, but I can't recall its exact meaning. Meaning that, that, Name sounds familiar. I've heard the Great Commission. Maybe you, you know, went to Sunday school and there was a flannel graph somewhere that talked about the Great Commission, right? But I couldn't really explain it to you. I couldn't really tell you what it was. I couldn't really articulate it to you. And an additional 6% were too afraid of giving the wrong answer. They just gave no answer. I, I'm not really sure. Which leaves us with only 17% of church attenders who say, yes, I know what the Great Commission is, and this is what it means, that they could even be able to articulate it in a way that is coherent, that makes sense, and, and is able to express the meaning of what the Great Commission is all about. Now, can I tell you, you may understand what the Great Commission is. We may have 17% that can articulate it to you, but the percentage that actually live it out is even lower than that. How, and I don't say this to make us feel bad because I mean, to be honest with you, I, I think that sometimes I'm better at preaching about Jesus than I am about actually sharing Jesus with my neighbor. It's not easy, but I promise you it's not gonna happen ever if we don't make it a point of attention, a point of focus, a point of prayer, something that is at the forefront of our mind. Man, we gotta wake up church and realize we have not been created to be consumers. 
We have not been designed to be people that fill a seat and just worry about the one. Our life was never meant to receive the gospel of grace and then just keep it to ourselves. The gospel from the very beginning was designed to be something that was made to share. And God created you to be the person who's opening up your life to share the gospel of grace with the many. But if it's not something we're thinking about, if it's not something that we give attention or focus to, man, I promise you, it's not gonna be something that is ever going to happen in our life. Practical question. When was the last time you spent time praying for someone you know that doesn't know Jesus by name on a regular basis? And can I add one more piece to that? Not just when was the last time you prayed for someone who didn't know Jesus by name, but when was the last time you prayed for them and included the statement, now God help me be the one that would share the gospel with them. Man, I I promise you, this is a huge part of what God has created for you to do here on this earth. But let's, don't just take the preacher's word for it. Man, let's go to the word of God. You guys still with me this morning? Come on, I know West Seattle's still with me. Here we go. Let's go back to Romans for a moment. If this is good, don't be afraid to shout me down. Come on, somebody. Just pretend it's Pastor Steve up here. Romans 10. We're going to read these verses again, starting in verse 13. We're going to walk through this progression that the Apostle Paul lays out. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Says, Man, there's good news. It's for everybody. The gospel's for everybody. This message of grace is for everybody. But we've got a problem. Because very few people are just waking up in the morning and going, I want to be a follower of Jesus. Just it doesn't always just happen with someone all on their own waking up one day and going, man, I really want to go to church. I really want to turn my life around and just believe in God when they haven't believed in God before. And here's what he says. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. Now we put this up here just so you could see the progression. It started with saved. Saved is the goal. When people accept the message of salvation, that is the goal of the gospel. But there's a progression the apostle Paul lays out for us and Before I explain the whole progression to you, I want to ask all of us a question. What was the process for you of how you were introduced to Jesus? How were you introduced to the gospel for the first time? Now, I know this probably isn't true for everyone, but I think that for the majority of us in the room, it probably looked something like this. Somebody was sent, whether it was your parents, whether it was a pastor or a preacher, maybe it was a neighbor, maybe it was a friend in middle school who invited you to youth church. I don't know, but I think for many of us in the room, there was somebody that was sent into your life. And what did they do? They told you. They told you about this Jesus. Maybe it was through your parents having conversation with you. Maybe it was through your parents taking you to church. Maybe it was through a pastor or a preacher preaching a message. Maybe it was through being invited to a home group or to a small group. Maybe it was somebody in your life who told you about the gospel of Jesus by the way they lived. You saw something different in them. There was something modeled in your life that was different than what you saw everywhere else. But my guess is for the majority of us in the room, there was somebody that was sent into your life who told you about the gospel of grace and you heard, you experienced, you saw. And in that process of seeing and hearing and experience this message of Jesus, there was a moment in your life where it went from black and white to full living color. And all of a sudden, the way you saw your world, the way you saw your brokenness, and the way you saw this thing called sin, it made sense. There was a correlation. There was a connection to the brokenness of your life and the way that you were living. And all of a sudden, you see this chasm between where you are and where you need to go. And you realize, I 
I've been working, I've been striving, I've been trying to make it happen on my own, but I've been unable and I need a savior. I need this Jesus. And there's a moment where you came to a place of belief. And as you believe in this message of Jesus, you called on him, you prayed a prayer. Maybe it was really eloquent. Maybe it was a repeat after me kind of prayer. Maybe it was really well thought out and put together. Or maybe it was raw on your knees in your bedroom when nobody else was watching. Maybe it was in your car when you were just so broken and frustrated. I don't know what the circumstance was, but I believe for many of us in the room, somebody was sent, somebody told you, you heard, you believed, and you came to a place where you received this grace called salvation and your life has been changed. And it doesn't mean that everything is perfect and awesome and you have no problems from this moment forward, but you have begun to experience the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You begin to experience a God who never leaves you, never forsakes you, but walks with you every step of the journey through the highs and through the lows that he never walks out on you, but he's always right by your side to give you whatever you need to make through what you're dealing with. Has anybody experienced this gift of salvation? Come on. But here's what I want you to see. Salvation is the goal. That's the whole purpose for the gospel is that none would perish, but that all would receive everlasting life. But the problem is salvation always begins with somebody being sent. The progression doesn't change. It always begins with someone being willing to go, I'll go, I'll share. I'll be willing to do it, not just for the one, but for the many. And it began 2000 years ago with this man named Jesus. Man, 2000 years ago, Jesus was not sitting up in heaven, bored out of his mind. and was like, man, you know what? They have really good pie down on earth. And I think I'm just gonna take a quick little 34 year field trip down there just to experience what life on earth is all about. The Bible says that Jesus was sent by the Father for the incredible purpose and design of sharing this gospel of grace through the most extravagant expression of the gospel that we will ever know through his physical death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave three days later. And today, 2000 years later, we are sitting in this room as the final byproduct of salvation realized in our life because 2000 years ago, a man named Jesus was sent. And what does he say in John 17 as he's praying? Jesus says, Father, just as you sent me, now I am sending them that the world might believe that you sent me. You have been made by design for the purpose of sharing the gospel. Now listen, I know that in this room right now, there's many of us who come from different backgrounds. You have different occupations. You live in different neighborhoods. You have different jobs. You have different skills. You have different personalities and character. But can I tell you something? God did not create you the way you are just so you could go work a job and make some money. God did not create you the way you are just so that you could be a homemaker. God did not create you the way you are. He didn't position you where you are just so that you could enjoy life on the east side of Seattle. Yes, I know, God's given you a gift in business and you wanna use that business to build the kingdom of God. But what is the kingdom of God? Is the kingdom of God building buildings? The kingdom of God is people. The kingdom of God are lost souls. What did Jesus say? I have come to seek and save the lost. You've been given a gift in business so that you can make money, so that we can build buildings that help reach one more person. So you can fuel ministry that's all about the many, not just the one. So that we can go to the highways and the byways and to spread this message called the gospel of grace. Because if we wanna see people saved, it means somebody's gotta be sent. Listen, you have been put in the neighborhood you're in, not just so you can enjoy your home and your space and the beauty of, of where you've been positioned. God put you in the neighborhood you're in because there's neighbors around you who need the gospel of grace so that you couldn't just drive into your driveway, hit the garage door and live your cozy Christian life. We are not designed to be consumers. We're designed to be dispensers. Can I even tell you, maybe God created your kid with some gifts and some talents not just so that you could show up to t-ball practice, but because there's gonna be a mom or a dad sitting down the bench from you that needs the gospel of grace. Maybe you've been made by design 
to share everywhere you go. What would it look like for us to realize that the greatest calling in my life is not just a J-O-B, because listen, we all have specific gifts that God has given us for the jobs he's created for us to do. But those, those jobs and those purposes are here. There is a superseding call that every single one of us have, as believers have. And it's the call to share the gospel. The great commission is not a good idea. It's a God command. What would it look like for you and for me to wake up every morning realizing Today, I'm being sent. What does it look like for you and for me every day to wake up, to pray, to ask God to give us eyes to see, to give us the boldness and the courage we need to do what he's created for us to do? Now listen, I, I, I confessed earlier, I'm not the best at this. In fact, part of the reason, Pastor Steve gave me the freedom to be able to preach on whatever I wanted today. That never happens. Just preach on whatever you want. You know what I tend to preach on a lot? I preach on the things that I'm wrestling with, things that I'm personally convicted about. And this has been something I've been thinking about a lot. I moved from the Issaquah Highlands where I'm so used to being around people all the time. We moved out uh, closer to Carnation. And to be honest with you, like I have to try to see my neighbors. In fact, I could go days without ever talking to someone. And I've been convicted because I couldn't even tell you the names of the people that live right next door to us. But I really believe that God's put us where he put us because we're sent. Now, I've been trying to think, oh, man, I even had a crazy idea. I was like, maybe I need to bake my neighbors some cookies. I don't make anything. I was like, rewind that. Maybe I need Carrie to bake some cookies because <laughs> I just need an excuse. I need, I need just an in. I just need an open door. I need to do something to go meet the people who live next door to me because it's gonna be really difficult for me to share with them if I don't have a relationship with them. And here's what I love about God. He never asks us to do something that he himself is not going to help us and empower us to do. You know, it'd be really, it'd be really a bad decision to try to go out and share the message of Jesus without the help of Jesus, without the power of Jesus. If you were to look in Acts chapter one, verse eight, this is literally the last conversation that Jesus is gonna have with the disciples before he ascends to heaven. And before he leaves, he says this, he says, don't, don't go anywhere, don't do anything, but I want you to wait. I want you to go, I want you to pray. And he says this, then I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Now, I want to just take a second here because a lot of times when we think about the purpose of the Holy Spirit, the reason we need the Holy Spirit is we think about the Holy Spirit being our guide or our counselor. We think about we need the Holy Spirit because we, we wanna see signs and wonders and miracles. We need the Holy Spirit for healing. We need the Holy Spirit for all these things. But the very first thing that Jesus talks about, the purpose of the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit, he says, when you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you will receive power to be my witnesses. The, the first purpose of the Holy Spirit is to empower you, to give you boldness to share the gospel of grace. Why? Because it's the primary purpose for why you were designed. God is wanting to empower you to give you this gift of the Holy Spirit, not just for the one, not just for personal consumption. Hello, somebody. God wants to pour his spirit into your life because he wants to empower you to do what he's created for you to do, to share the gospel of grace with many. Now, here's what I want to, to give you before we wrap up. He says, I wanna empower you to be my witnesses. God did not say, I wanna empower you to be an amazing theologian to send you into the city streets to be able to win theological arguments and to be able to convince people through your incredible head knowledge. Is it important for us to understand scripture? Yes. Is it important for you to understand your theology? Absolutely. It, we need more understanding of the Bible, but what being a witness is, if you even think about it in its judiciary term, it's being someone who shares what you have seen and what you have experienced. Nothing more, nothing less. I think sometimes we get so tripped up on our own feet about sharing our faith because we think, well, if I don't say the right things and if I don't have all the answers and if I can't you know, debunk every Neil Tyson Degrassi thing that they've heard about you know, the big bang and all, then, then I'm just gonna lose the argument. It's not an argument. All you're doing is sharing your story. 
All you're doing is finding ways to share what God has done in your life, the difference that God has made in your life, just to begin to express to them why you believe in God. What was the moment where he became real to you? How has your life been different since you said yes to the gospel? Maybe we need to be more interested in witnessing than we are about winning arguments. Maybe it looks more like just inviting someone over for dinner than it does inviting them over to have an argument, right? Maybe you need to invite some people into your life so that they can see the way you treat your spouse. Maybe you need to invite some people into your life so that they can first see the way that you parent your kids. Maybe you need to invite them over so that they can see your, uh, you know, your hobby lobby artwork that hangs on your wall in the kitchen that has scripture on it. And they go, maybe there is something different about your life. Maybe we need to be more active about inviting people in to see the gospel in us. And maybe we need to start doing what Revelation talks about, overcoming the enemy through the the blood of the lamb, which is the work of Jesus and the word of our testimony. What does a witness give? Their testimony. Is there anybody in here today that's got a testimony of what God has done in your life? Is there anybody that's got a witness? My life has been changed. Man, I had, I had a place in my life where I made some mistakes. I was running my own race. I was going my own direction. I was living for the one, but in the midst of my brokenness, come on somebody, Jesus met me right where I was. He picked me up. He gave me a new life. He gave me a new future. He gave me a new hope. Man, my life's been different. It hasn't been perfect. It hasn't been easy, but man, he's never left me. He's never given up on me. Man, we've had some difficulties in our marriage. We couldn't have made it on our own, but man, the gospel, the grace of Jesus has helped us. Yeah, we've had some difficulties raising our kids. There's been some ups and downs, but man, God has been there every step of the way. He's helped us so much. Man, I don't know where I'd be without the gospel of grace in my life. We, I'll clap for myself, somebody, let's go. You've been made to share. The gospel has been made to share. I don't wanna be a person who misses the entire design for why Jesus came in the first place. Because it's never been about me. It's always been about being a recipient of grace, not for the sake of the one, but for the sake of the many. And here's what I wanna do today. I believe there's some of us in this room who honestly, today is, is your day. This is your moment. You've been sitting in here, whether in Issaquah or in West Seattle, and your heart's been beating through your chest. I hear this all the time. People say, I feel like I was the only person in the room. I just felt you were talking right to me the entire time, because I feel like there's some of us in this room today. Maybe you've never been in church before. Maybe you're a prodigal. You've grown up in church, but you just know in your heart of hearts, you're not where you're supposed to be this morning. You need to know this. Jesus was sent to the earth for you, and he knew you were going to be here today. And he wants you to know this, that you're not too far gone. You haven't made too many mistakes. Maybe you've been dealing with a lot of weight and heaviness and baggage in your life. He wants to to come alongside of you. The Bible says that if anyone puts their faith in Christ, they're a new creation. The old life is gone a new life has begun. That literally he takes our sins and he casts them away from us as far as the East is from the West. That he literally comes into our circumstance, that he cleans us off, he picks us up. He gives us a new name, a new direction, a new destiny, a new life, a new future and a new eternity. Come on somebody. And if you're here today and you feel like you're not where you're supposed to be. This moment is for you. And what I wanna do is I just wanna take a moment, we're gonna pray both here and in West Seattle. And after we're done, we're just gonna uh, take a moment, we're gonna pray for those who need Jesus. And then we're gonna take a moment, we're gonna pray for every one of us in the room that we would not only receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but that we would begin daily to give attention and focus to the purpose of sharing the gospel, that every day we would begin to pray, Holy Spirit, help me today. Holy Spirit, give me eyes to see. Holy Spirit, give me the words to speak. Holy Spirit, give me the the courage and the boldness I need to not only see the opportunities, but step into the opportunities. Because here's what's gonna happen. When you begin to pray the bold prayer of God, show me the opportunities, you're gonna to begin to see things differently in your, in your week, in your day. Those conversations that used to be really ordinary and really normal, all of a sudden God's gonna go, right now, that person, this is the moment. And when those moments happen, there's gonna be a wrestle in your spirit. There's gonna be the part of you that says, go for it. And then there's gonna be the other part of you that goes, 
felt that before? I have. What did the apostle Paul say? There's two parts of us. There's the flesh and the spirit and they're constantly opposed to each other. The spirit wants what the flesh doesn't want and the flesh wants what the spirit doesn't want. There's a wrestle in your soul. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to empower us to overcome our fleshly obstacles to step into the God-designed moments in our life, amen? So would you stand with me both here in Issaquah and in West Seattle? We're gonna take a moment to respond right now. And after I'm done praying, Pastor Craig is gonna come in West Seattle and lead us in, in response. But all across the room, would you do this? Would you take a moment, would you close your eyes? Bow your heads. We do this not because it makes this moment any more spiritual, but it just helps us focus on what God is saying to us right here, right now. And if you're here and you just honestly say, Pastor Josh, you're talking to me today. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I need this Jesus. I need this gospel. I need this gift of salvation in my life. Maybe you need God to forgive you of some issues. Maybe you need God to come in and bring some healing into your heart. Maybe you need God to pick you up and move you from your place of brokenness into a place of wholeness. No matter what your journey, your story may be, if you want to say yes to Jesus today and you want that fresh beginning we were talking about, if that's you, both here and in West Seattle, would you just begin to lift your hand right now so I know who I'm praying for? Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Man, hands are going up all over the place. This is your moment. This is your day. You don't have to walk out of here carrying the same brokenness, the same baggage. This is the opportunity where the gospel of grace is meeting you right where you are right now. God, we just thank you right now for every person that's raising their hand. God, we just give you, we give you glory and honor. Lord, I pray right now that you begin to speak to every person in this very moment. Lord, I pray that you begin to pour your forgiveness, your grace. Lord, I pray right now they begin to experience the, the wholeness that is found in Jesus. Lord, that there'd be a lifting of the weight of the brokenness off of their heart. And right now in this moment, they would begin to feel the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, the joy of the Lord that's only found through the gift of your salvation. God, that right now there'd be a sense of a, of, of a clean break and a fresh start. Lord, that there's a new day, that there's hope for what they're dealing with, that there's a new life that can be found in Christ. God, we just pray this right now over every person that has their hand raised. If you just raise your hand before we move on, I just wanna encourage you, don't leave this place before We've had an opportunity to have one of our prayer team and one of our pastors pray with you. This is a monumental moment in your journey. And yes, it's easy to slide out the back door and go on with the rest of your day, but I promise you this moment needs to be cemented in your heart. So after we dismiss, don't, don't run out, but come forward. I allow one of our team to pray for you. The second prayer I wanna to pray today is for anybody in the room who's here today and says, man, I wanna put a stake in the ground today. I wanna make a decision as for me, I'm, I'm done living for the one, but I'm ready to live my life for my God designed purpose of sharing the gospel with others. But God, I need your help to do it. And if you're here today and you'd say, God, I want you to use me. God, I want you to put your anointing on me. God, I want you to empower me. God, I want you to send me. Lord, give me eyes to see, give me a a heart that's broken for my neighbors. God, help me step into the opportunities. If that's you, just hands up all over this room and in West Seattle right now, you wanna get under this prayer, you want God to use your life. Lord, right now we come to you as a church that doesn't want to just attend a service, but God, we want to be the church that you had in your heart, a church that is sent every day into the highways and the byways, to our city streets and to our neighborhoods, to our, our uh, co-ops and to our PTA meetings, into our workplace and to our neighborhoods with the gospel of grace to be dispensed to every person we can. And God, I pray that we would begin to focus and give attention to this design, that every day we would wake up with purpose, that every day we would wake up realizing that, Lord, you've given us a calling to go and to share. And Lord, that we would activate the spirit of God in our life for the purpose of witnessing, for the purpose of sharing. And God, I pray that every day we would begin to pray and ask you to lead us, to guide us, to give us eyes to see, to give us the boldness and the courage we need, that we wouldn't live in fear, we wouldn't live in insecurity, God, that we wouldn't be held back by the worries of our flesh, but God, that we would overcome our flesh through the gift of your spirit. And Lord, I pray that next weekend, when we gather together as the church, we wouldn't just show up to try to get filled up to survive another week, but we would show up with a friend on our left or on our right, walking them through the doors, introducing them to friends friends, having them sit in service with us, praying under our breath the whole time, going, God, let today be the day. Let today be the day that they would receive the gift of salvation. And God, we realize it starts with us being sent. So God, now send us. Send us into this community. 
full of passion, full of faith, full of boldness, full of your spirit to go build your kingdom through the ways that you have created and positioned us to fulfill the purpose of sharing the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.